you're probably familiar with the expression pulling a hammy. If you're a big time athlete, you might have experienced a sort of injury yourself at some point in time. Pulled hamstrings are one of the more common types of soft tissue injuries in all sports. But what actually qualifies as a hamstring muscle and how does this injury occur? This is something that we're going to be covering as we explore the posterior compartment of the thigh. Good day, and welcome to this installment of the Gross Anatomy video podcast series. This is Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Today, we finish off our look at the thigh by considering the posterior compartment, and then we'll start our transition into the leg with a look at the popliteal fossa, and that's the space behind the knee. Once again, one of the shorter sessions, it'd be a good idea to make use of the accompanying KLE exercises that go along with it. In this session, we'll be looking at the muscles and the neurovascular components of the posterior compartment and making mention of what a pulled hamstring is and its implications. Before diving in, let's return briefly to this overview slide of the compartments of the thigh. In the previous session, we discussed the anterior and medial compartments. We complete the picture today with a look at the posterior compartment. This is made up primarily of the hamstring muscle group, responsible for hip extension and knee flexion. It's supplied by perforating arterial branches off the profunda femoris artery and, as we will discuss, is innervated by specific nerve branches from the sciatic nerve. The posterior compartment is made up of three separate muscles, one with two very distinct heads. Three of the muscle bellies originate off the ischial tuberosity and can be palpated during the act of standing from a sitting position. This is collectively referred to as the hamstring muscle group. The name's a little barbaric, actually. It stems from the butcher shop. When pigs were slaughtered, the thigh was opened up and this tendon served to string the animal up in the smokehouse. The three muscles share a common function as well as a common innervation. Two of the muscles insert medially, while the bicipital muscle fuses laterally. The more superficial of the medial muscles is the semitendinosus muscle, so named because of its long cord-like tendinous insertion. From the ischial tuberosity, the semitendinosus projects medially to insert on the anteromedial surface of the tibia. We identified this insertion point in the previous lesson. Thus, the semitendinosus is the third muscle to insert as the pes anserinus. Deep to the semitendinosus is the semimembranosus muscle. Its name is the result of its larger and more distinct tendon, which lies both medial and lateral to the tendon for semitendinosus. Both of these tendons can be palpated on the medial side of the knee, particularly when the muscles are actively contracting. The semimembranosus projects deep to the semitendinosus to insert inferior to the medial condyle of the tibia. The biceps femoris muscle is the lateral muscle in this posterior compartment. As the name implies, it is actually a combination of two separate heads. The long head originates with the semitendinosus and membranosus and thus acts as both the hip and knee joints, whereas the short head acts on the knee joint exclusively. This distinction, as well as the fact that the two heads receive different innervation, mean that the short head is not considered part of the hamstring muscle group. Again, we can feel this insertion of the muscle, but this time as a single tendon instead of as two distinct tendons as in the case on the medial side. The long head runs obliquely from its origin off the ischial tuberosity to insert laterally on the head of the fibula. The short head takes a more direct route, originating off the posterolateral surface of the distal shaft of the femur. Again, it blends with the long head to insert on the head of the fibula. The function of the hamstring portion of the posterior compartment is to extend the hip while flexing the knee. If the knee extensors act synergistically to resist flexion, the result is pure extension at the hip. In this capacity, the hamstrings are the principal hip extensors in walking. Note, once again, that the short head of biceps femoris can only contribute to knee flexion. It has no function at the hip joint. As mentioned at the onset of the video, hamstrings are a common source of injury in athletes. Now, contrary to what the image here demonstrates, injuries are most commonly found in the superolateral portions of the conjoined muscle bellies at the myotendinous junction and typically involve the biceps femoris muscle. 
Like all muscle strains, the severity can be classified into one of three grades. Grade one, or mild strains, show minimal tearing, but significant pain that impedes activity, likely as a protective mechanism. Grade two, or moderate strains, present with significant tearing in the muscle or myotendinous junction and a def definite loss in strength. A grade three is a complete tear of one of the hamstring bellies. Avulsion fractures, in which sudden forceful contractions or pulls break a portion of the insertion of the initial tuberosity, may occur as well. Mild to moderate hamstring tears are generally treated with a price approach, and the athlete may return to play within two weeks of the injury. We've already discussed the vascular supply to the posterior compartment from the previous lesson. Recall the perforating branches off the deep femoral artery that pierce through the adductor magnus to reach and supply the posterior compartment. Innervation to the posterior compartment is from the sciatic nerve. As previously stated, the sciatic nerve is actually a combination of two different nerve segments. The tibial portion innervates the hamstring muscle group, while the common fibular portion innervates the short head of the biceps femoris exclusively. We finish off this topic by revisiting the cutaneous nerve distribution to the thigh. A series of nerve branches, known collectively as the anterior femoral cutaneous nerves, project off the femoral nerve and supply the skin along the anteromedial surface of the thigh. Although not shown here, a small cutaneous branch from the obturator nerve supplies a small patch of skin along the medial surface as well. The posterior femoral cutaneous branch is a distinct branch off the lumbosacral plexus that courses medially next to the deeper running sciatic nerve. This supplies the skin along the posterior aspect of the thigh. Finally, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is another separate branch off the lumbar plexus. And we'll see this nerve more completely when we dive into the posterior abdominal wall, where it emerges in the pelvis between the psoas major and the iliacus muscles. From here, it will course over the top of iliacus to emerge through the femoral triangle, just posterior medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. This supplies the skin over the lateral aspect of the thigh. That does it for this overview of the posterior compartment of the thigh. On the other side of the break, we'll be looking at the borders and contents of a region known as the popliteal fossa, located at the back of the knee. See you then.